Hello, I'm Alexia. Let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing tips to help you get into the fearless mindset. Fear Free Childbirth is the online destination for women seeking to take the fear out of birth with fear clearance meditations, online fear clearance courses and programmes for overcoming tocophobia. Find out more at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leach, and thank you so much for joining me today. On today's show, I have a wonderful guest who will be joining me for lots of wonderful chit-chat around birth, pregnancy, oh, maternal mental health. I mean, there is so much we talk about. Today, I'm going to be joined by doula of the year, no less, from uh, last year, Sophie Brigstock. So we have got a jam-packed conversation that basically takes a little bit of a tour of pregnancy, motherhood, breastfeeding. I mean, you name it, um, we talk about it. So anyway, but before I hand over to that conversation, I've got a couple of things I want to share with you. So first of all, webinars. I'm not sure if you're aware, but I'm running a webinar this evening, which is the Tackling Tocophobia webinar. And this is for women who suffer from the extreme fear of birth and pregnancy. So uh, that is known as tocophobia. You may have heard me talk about it already on the podcast. So um, yeah, it is not too late to register. If you listen to this the minute this podcast comes out, it'll be happening UK time at 8 p.m., on Thursday. I will be running it again if you miss it. There will be a replay as well. Fingers crossed there'll be a replay anyway. If the tech gods don't mess with me, there will be a replay. God help me. So God, yes, please. Um, so yeah, even if you um, you miss the live, you might be able to catch the replay. It all depends on when you're listening to this podcast. But if you you are listening to this and it's not October 2018 anymore, then the best thing for you to do is check the Tocophobia, the I'm Tocophobic page on the Fear Free Childbirth website, which you can find straight from the homepage. Just go to the start here menu um, and then I will indicate on that page whether there's a webinar planned and if not, you can join a wait list for the next time that I run the webinar. Okay, and then I've got another webinar and this one is for birth workers and doulas and midwives. I know I have a lot of birth workers that listen to the show and I'm getting a lot of inquiries from women, well not women, I'm sorry I'm not even concentrating, I'm getting a lot of inquiries from birth workers who want to know more about how they can support women to have a fear-free birth. Since my book Fearless Birthing came out I'm getting a lot of emails from uh, birth workers that just want more information, they want to support the women that they work with using the fearless birthing approach. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a webinar to share more information about all that. So So if you're interested in uh, coming live to the webinar, you can ask me lots of questions. Um, We're going to have a good chinwag, I reckon, good cups of tea, maybe some cake. So um, yeah, check out the, um, there'll be a banner on the website so you can find it there. But also if you just go to the birth worker page as well, then you'll be able to get a link to the sign up page there. So to find the birth worker page, you just go to the start here menu and it's the page called I'm a birth worker. So that's for all birth workers, midwives, doulas, birth therapists, co- pregnancy coaches, um, whatever you might do to support women, yoga teachers, I don't know, um, in terms of supporting women through pregnancy and in preparing for birth, then um, I will be doing a webinar just for you. That is happening in November, on November the 7th, I think, I'd have to check. Um, I think that's the date I've put in. Anyway, so you've got some time to get your name on the list. So I would look forward to having you there. Anyway, enough about this chit chat about webinars. Now is time for me to tell you a little bit more about this week's guest. Today I'm chatting to Sophie Brigstock, who is a doula. In fact, she won doula of the year 2017. So she is a, well, she's a total birth junkie, actually. And we talk a little bit about that and where her interest from birth came from. But she also shares her own birth story that she uh, found out from her mother. Also, she shares her own, the birth of her kids. Now, her own birth journey has been a very difficult one for her and there's so much to learn from hearing her talk about her story which is pretty powerful so um, yeah definitely worth listening to. 
in terms of that. But then we also talk about all lots of other really good stuff in terms of preparing emotionally and mentally for your birth, how you can prepare for breastfeeding, how you can really invest in doing things that will help you with your emotional and mental well-being post-birth. And talk about things like how you can tune into your mothering instinct. Um, you know, there's so much that we talk about in this conversation. It really is a whole spectrum of birthy stuff. And definitely, you can definitely tell she is a birth junkie. So I'm really, I, I know you are going to love listening to Sophie today. Welcome, Sophie, to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. This is brilliant. I've got another doula of the year on the podcast, so I am privileged. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just giving a little bit away about what you do, Sophie. But yeah, <laughs> we're going to be talking about birth, all sorts of other stuff. So just before we do, just introduce yourself to my listeners, if you would. Oh, um, where to start? Um, so basically, I am a birth and postnatal doula. I'm based in southwest London. Um, and since 2012, I've also been um, training doulas um, with nurturing birth. Um, so I, I run doula courses in the UK and, and beyond. I'm breastfeeding peer supporter. I'm a baby massage teacher. I seem to have too many feathers <laughs> to my cap. <laughs> But basically, you're a bit of a birth junkie from what it's Totally, like. complete <laughs> birth junkie. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, well, I, I don't know. Some people know, so not everyone is. But I think <laughs> definitely people that work in the birth world do tend to be total birth junkies. Yeah. So what got you into birth? What was the thing that got you really, well, that turned you on to birth in the first place? I think actually the funny thing is if you if you're talking about being a birth junkie um I thought it was completely normal that uh whenever my mum took me to the public library when I was kind of 10 11 12 years old that I went and looked at the books about puberty and about pregnancy and about birth and about breastfeeding I thought that was completely normal no it's not well, that's what everybody else did <laughs> no, isn't it no and, um, and actually you know whenever my friends discovered I'd picked up yet another book called have you started yet or you know I don't know that that you know they were they looked at me slightly askance so I think it was there right from the get-go. And, and actually, my family um, still laugh that from the age of two, um, I was talking about wanting to work with babies. I mean, in, back in when I was tiny, um, I, I talked a lot about being a paediatrician because I knew that. I spent a lot of time in Great Ormond Street when I was, when I was little. And so I was around... Um, I was around nurses and doctors and, and young children and babies, and I loved that. And to me, a paediatrician was someone who got to work with babies, and mm. um, and I thought that was fantastic. So I spent my whole childhood sort of working towards that. And then I, I deviated off for about 10 years. I went and, and, and sort of frittered away with um, film and theatre and drama and um, those kind of things, and uh, and then found um, after my son was born, the the company I was working for, the film company I was working for, folded, and so I was in this position of thinking, well, what the hell do I do next? And it wasn't obvious, and shouldn't it have been because you know it had been the thing that had been my passion all my life. So I sort of I fell back into it by accident, really. And once I did it, there was no stopping me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you were doing all this stuff when you were like a child. I think that's fascinating because I, I couldn't bear anything like that. I really hated all that. But then that, I guess that was my tocophobia showing its face from a very early age, that kind of fear of birth. I didn't like babies. I didn't like, I didn't like any of that. So, yeah, so looking back, that was probably why. But, yeah, if you were kind of destined to do that and you had a real passion for it from the beginning, it makes total yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was always, and it's funny, I, I see my daughter doing the same thing now. She's 12, and her nickname is Mini Doula. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. take her anywhere where there are young children or babies. She's in there. She's she's begging me to start babysitting, and I feel really horrible. Because I'm like, no, you're too young. <laughs> so tell me then, I, I'm curious, do you know what your own birth was like? Have you? What did you hear from your mother? Like, do you know what that was like? I do, I do. Um, so she was told um, she had a very, very difficult pregnancy in that I was an unexpected baby. I um, I was one of those ones that came out holding the coil. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 
so my my parents had just got married and um and my mum was very young and um had decided that actually she was going to pursue her her love of acting and she was um just about to start a degree course at university and at the interview they said oh well we see that you know you're newly married are you planning children and she's like no 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 not yet I'm far too young and and little did she know that there I was already kind of going hello <laughs> So, um, so she was pregnant, which was a huge shock um, to them both, I think. And then, um, very, very sadly, her mother died very suddenly, unexpectedly, when she was three months pregnant. And I think her pregnancy was, was consumed with grief. Mm. And she got to my, the estimated due date, and the medics, even in those days, were doing that whole thing of uh, we need to induce you because, and in this case, they thought it was because I was very small. We need to induce you because your baby's very small and we need to, you know, we need to get her out. And so they induced her and less than four hours later, there I was. Um, so it was, you know, whatever she was given worked very quickly and I flew out and um, so she talks very positively about the birth and how easy it was. And, um, yeah, I mean, she says it was incredibly intense that, uh, you know, and I, I now know from the work that I do that, you know, if someone says they had a quick birth, that doesn't necessarily mean easy or yeah. you know, <laughs> fantastic. That can be uh, <laughs> hardcore. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, so I flew out and um, so for her, birth was, was relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to my brother, um, he flew out in an hour and a half. I mean, you know, it was just so quick. Um, so I went into pregnancy myself thinking that oh, this is going to be a doggle. You know, like, it's going to be so easy. Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> You're saying it now as if like, and then it wasn't. Is, is that no. Any... <laughs> no, 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 it really wasn't. <laughs> And the sad thing was that at that point in my life, I I was fully in this other part of my my life. I was fully into the, the sort of theatre and the film stuff. My my passion for 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 puberty and women's bodies and my interest was there. But the knowledge that I know now, um, and I hadn't even heard of doulas. I didn't know what a doula was until well after my children were born. Yeah. Um, so, um, yes, I mean, I did do quite a lot of reading and, um, and I was that one in the antenatal class. I mean, I love my, my group of girls that I met on, on my course. We're still thick as thieves 15 years later. Um, but they still laugh at me because I was the one in the group saying, well, you know, I'm going to be in a pool and I'm going to be using aromatherapy oils and can you burn candles in a hospital? And, you know, asking those kind of questions. And the, the teacher uh, with, for the group was saying things like, well, you know, 25% of women have caesareans. And I was the smug cow on the end going, well, that's not going to be me, obviously, because I'm going to breathe my baby out in a pool with whale song playing and aromatherapy oils burning. But uh, yeah, sadly, my son had very, very different ideas. And, uh, and so that was not to be. So how was it? What did it turn out to be then? Um, well, it was, um, my pregnancy was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I loved being pregnant. I felt, I mean, it just everything I'd always loved about, you know, everything that I'd read since the age of 11 was there and I just, I felt amazing and I felt healthy and strong and given so much previous ill health in my life, that was an amazing place to be. And, um, and then when I was 38 weeks, um, I went for my midwife appointment and she measured my bump, the tape measure, which I always thought was just so ridiculous. And, and you know, I'd have three different people measure it and come up with totally different measurements for fundal height. Um, and she measured it and she said, oh, well, I think your baby's a bit small. So we're going to send you for a scan today. He's head down, but uh, we just want to, you know, make sure everything's OK. And I was furious. I was so cross. I was like, hey, he's absolutely fine and I'm fine and don't be ridiculous and bore, you know. And I, um, so... <laughs> 
resentfully, I went for a scan, grabbed my husband, went for a scan, and they said, oh, no, he's a perfectly good good size. I was, I told you so. And then they said, but he's not head down. And I said, well, no, I mean, it feels like the spin cycle of the washing machine all the time. It always has done. He never, ever stops moving. And they said, well, no, at this stage, that's not actually what we want to be happening. Uh, and he was what was called a, a transverse breach or an oblique, an unstable lie. And so what he was doing literally was kind of just spinning round all the time. And so I then got admitted to hospital. And I was like, what, what, what's going on? This is crazy. You know, my baby's healthy. I'm healthy. This is all fine. And they said, well, no, actually, there's a very serious risk of cord prolapse if your waters break. So we need you to be in the hospital in case something happens. Um, so I was in for eight days and they said, you're here until you have your baby or until he goes head or bum down. And so they would come and palpate every single day and they'd say, oh, well, today he's here and now he's moved over to here. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I can feel him moving around. Um, and on about day seven, when they came to check him at that particular moment, he decided to sit down in the hole. You know, he put his bum down and they said, oh, OK, fine. We'll do an ECV then, uh, and, uh, a cephalic version uh, external cephalic version sounds terribly serious, doesn't it? Um, so they took me onto a labour ward because there's a risk when they do it that, you know, your waters are going to break and you're going to labour. And they turned him. And so this, this obstetrician came and moved my baby, which was not a problem because Alf liked to move a lot. And, you know, so they moved him. And then I had four student midwives hold him in place for 45 minutes <laughs> as I lay on this bed. And, uh, and then they said, if he's still in the same place in 24 hours, you can go home and we'll see you when you go into labor. And they came and saw me the next morning and they said, he's still in the same place, go home. And, and I did, but actually I couldn't really stand up properly. It's, you know, the way that he'd been moved or whatever, it was, it left me really uncomfortable. And I think it left him uncomfortable too. Mm. Um, so I went home and, you know, having been on a busy, brightly lit, noisy antenatal ward for over a week, I was pretty tired and I was pretty uncomfortable. So it was lovely to have a week at home and to just rest up and nest and all of those kind of things. And then I went into pre-labor and that was amazing. I, just, I felt like the the strongest most powerful woman in the world i just felt amazing and i grabbed my poor husband and i dragged him around battersea park for most of the day it was a, thankfully a beautiful october day and we walked round and round the park and and my contractions were coming sporadically but kind of every i don't know 7 to 10 minutes through the day and and then we'd come home and eat something and i had a little snooze and then they carried on and of course come the evening they got a bit more intense and then i got to a point where i thought right no this really is hotting up quite a lot now this is more intense and i feel like i need to go in and I went in and the ward was incredibly busy and they took one look at me and said, we don't think you're in labor. We're going to put you in this room and we're going to strap you up to a monitor. But they left me for two hours. And when they came back, you know, all of them with this sort of you're not in labor attitude, they took one look and went, oh, God, we're really sorry. You are, aren't you? Um, and, you know, obviously I was contracting quite effectively, but when they did an internal examination, they said, you're not dilating because his head is nowhere near your cervix. He is nowhere near your cervix. And to cut a very long story short, actually, he didn't go anywhere near my cervix and I didn't dilate. So I got sent home the next morning. Everything stopped. We got sent home. They said, get some proper rest, have a nice walk, have a, have a meal, have a glass of wine with your meal, they said, and we'll see you probably in the evening. And for the next 10 days, it 10 was, days. The next 10 days, it was stop, start, stop, start. And it was more stop than start. And so I did everything I could to try and make things happen. I had lots of very painful acupuncture, and I realized now that – I didn't need acupuncture because my body was already trying to do it. 
But because he was where he was, i.e. not in the right position, he was really kind of stuck to one side. Um, you know, nothing was going to, it wasn't going to work. Mm. And he didn't shift. And so finally we got to the dreaded 42 weeks and they said, well, we think we need to induce you. And when I went in to be induced, they said, oh, but you're already contracting. And I was like, yes, I know. <laughs> I've been contracting on and off for 10 days. Um, so they tried to break my waters. They couldn't. They gave me a pessary. That got things going a bit. Um, and then it was that typical cascade of intervention. Um, and actually, with all of it, I still felt incredibly strong, incredibly powerful. Even when I had Syntocinon put in, um, I didn't. I absolutely didn't want to have an epidural or anything. I was like, "This is this feels amazing." Like the sensations that my body is giving me is absolutely mind blowing, mm. and I feel really strong. And it wasn't until several hours into it, they'd mentioned C-section a few times along the way, and every time they did, I just burst into tears I was just absolutely adamant that was not what I wanted and they um eventually they said you know we this baby is has not come down at all um obviously they'd broken my waters that put this time clock on and we got to a point where I made the decision I sat down with my husband and I came to a point I looked at him and said he's not coming there's, you know, I know that I, my body's been trying to do this for 10 days. My body has been trying to birth this baby, but for some reason, it's not happening. And so we need to go for a, a cesarean now. And he said, yeah, that seems right. So that was all, it was a really lovely, calm decision. Gutting. I mean, mm. so gutting. Because it was not what I, I mean, so far removed from you know whale song and birth pools and and aromatherapy oils and all of that. Mm. But it was my decision, and it felt good. And so this was about midnight at this point, and they said we're really busy. Um, you're fine. The baby's fine. We've put in an epidural now because we need to have that in place for the for the section. Um, so why don't you get some rest? Why doesn't your husband go and get something to eat? And we'll do it probably in the next two to three hours. And I was like, okay, great, fine, that's all good. Had a little cry, thought I would have a you know bit of sleep. Sent my husband off for an egg mayo sandwich. I mean, why he chose that? I mean, ugh. Um, anyway, he disappeared off, and then suddenly the alarm bells went, and Alf had um, had gone into distress, and so suddenly there was. A, a real rush to get me into theatre and to get me numb enough to get him out quickly. Mm -hmm. And he had done a meconium poo, and uh, and obviously that can be a sign of distress in babies. So suddenly it was all alarm, you know, emergency situation. And they rushed me in, and it looked like they weren't going to be able to get me numb quickly enough. So they were talking about general anaesthetics and. Um, obviously my, my husband was nowhere to be seen because he was in the 24 hour shop finding an egg mayo sandwich. And, um, so I was panicking about trying to get him back, um, which thankfully he did. And he was, you know, ashen, very scared. And I was very scared and, you know, we got rushed into theater and thankfully I was awake, but there weren't enough people in theater. It really was a, a you know, a nasty sort of. Mm -hmm actually crash cesarean situation and um and they got him out and he was he was okay but he was taken off to a, you know a resuscitator over at the other end of the theater and they were suctioning him and making sure that he was breathing and then they wrapped him up and they put him in a towel and they gave him to my husband and there was no discussion about skin to skin there was no concept of of putting him to the breast or anything like that and I in my head all that mattered to me was that I got my baby to my breast. I, I had this strong, powerful instinct that that needed to happen quickly. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, I hadn't, I didn't know the stuff that I know now. Um, and so it wasn't until we got to recovery about an hour or so after the operation was, was finished, where I said quite tearfully to the midwife, please, please, can you help me? Because I know I need to get my baby on me, you know, in the first hour or so for the feeding to happen. And it mattered to me. It mattered so much that I 
be able to breastfeed because had I not been able to do that, I think I would have gone down a very, very, very slippery slope with fear of uh, with failure. Mm. You know, my I felt like for for whatever reason my body had let me down when it came to the cesarean. But if I couldn't feed my baby on top of that, that would have been the ultimate failing. Mm. And actually, it was difficult. The first two weeks were really, really hard. He didn't have that instinct. I think we did miss that that golden moment, that opportunity when they first go to the skin. And um, so it took a huge amount of persistence um, to, to get the breastfeeding started. But thankfully, we did. And once he got going, we were fine. And, and hallelujah for that, because yeah. I that made me feel, and, and the, the the positive that feelings that came from from having a, a, a good breastfeeding journey made such a difference. Mm-hmm. Such a difference. And I'm just curious with the the whole way that that kind of unfolded. When you know, just hearing what you just said I, in my mind, I'm like, well, if they'd left your bump alone in the first place, he probably would have been all right. I mean, is that is that I don't know. Like, it feels like they probably put him in a funny position. Do you think, or do you Anna, do you think it was your body? I, you know, it sounds to me like it wasn't your body failing at all. It was other people interfering. Yeah, I. It's interesting. I mean, you know, I have uh, and one of the most important things I believe for doulas to do is to 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 debrief their own stories and and to look at their stuff because it would be so wholly inappropriate as a doula to bring my stuff to somebody else's journey. Mm. So actually, I never talk about this stuff with my doula clients, so I apologize to any of them <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> But, um, it's been very interesting so thank you for sharing no 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 well I I mean I, I find storytelling to be the most powerful tool I love it I absolutely love it so and I do think that mine is an interesting story and I, I think you know over time so many things have bubbled up to the surface about it all um, I do think yes I, I'm sad that we went down the ECV route I don't think that was the appropriate thing to do um, I went into my second pregnancy um, planning a VBAC and I worked, um, again, didn't know about doulas, but I worked myself towards that um, and and my, my doctors, uh, my midwives, they were all very supportive of that and hallelujah, my daughter seemed to put herself head down from, you know, a sensible time and we were like, woohoo, this is great, this time round's going to be different. And then when I went for my 39-week appointment with her, they said, ah, she's popped out to the side. Having been head down, she is head down, but she's not quite where we want her to be. And so at that point, they said, right, we're going to do an elective section now, today, like now. And thankfully, it being my second baby, and I see this a lot with women having had one experience and time to debrief and reflect, they then, they behave a bit differently in a second pregnancy. They can be a little bit stroppier. (laughs) They can be a bit more, no, actually, you're not going to do that right now, Um, which is what I did. And I said, no, I'm going home. I'm going to go and make the necessary arrangements for my two-year-old because his mummy's going to have to go into hospital, be in hospital for several days And I'm going to get my husband and I'm going to tell my family, I'm going to put my support network in place so that I can come back and have this cesarean calmly this evening. And they sort of went, oh, okay then, Um, but but you will come back, won't you? (laughs) So I did, you know, two, three hours later, I went back. And uh, and the fear was that my waters were going to break, which frankly was laughable because they completely failed to break my waters the first time round. I think mine are kind of, I don't know, titanium clad, my waters. Um, so I wasn't worried that my waters were going to break and my cord was going to prolapse, which was their great fear. Um, so we went back in and it was, uh, so the second time round I had what's known as an elective emergency cesarean. And oh my goodness what a difference and and I know that now in in some of the the work that's been done around women-centered cesareans in the last few years that um you know it could have gone even further in terms of being an experience for me 
Um, but it was so much calmer. It was just lovely. And they brought her out in her own time. And they, without my saying anything, I didn't realize that, you know, I could waver birth preferences at them or anything like that. But without my even asking, they just popped her straight down my top in theater. And within 10 minutes, this brand new tiny baby, and she was only six pounds two, bless her, um, had found the breast and latched on on her own. I was like, oh my God, that's incredible. Um, and my ultimate fear going into having two children was that I had this insane two-year-old running around. I mean, he was doing exactly what he'd done in the womb in real life. You know, he was running around like a nutter in circles all the time. <laughs> and I had this fear that when I had my second baby, how was I ever going to sit down and feed this baby when I couldn't take my eyes off my toddler for a nanosecond? And she obviously got the message because she arrived and she would feed and be done and dusted in 10 minutes. I mean, whole thing done, fine, absolutely sorted, you know, and I could just pop her in a sling or whatever and, and be attentive to my to my son. So that was that was amazing. Mm. Well, they're a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for, I think. Oh, wow. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've come across Suzanne Zedek um, and her work, but I saw her at the Mama Conference last month and she was showing videos of eight-week-old babies responding to themselves in a in a what they thought of as a, a mirror and how if they did a time delay they were completely affected by what they saw mirrored back at them and we don't give babies enough credit they yeah. are so bright they're so conscious they're so connected right from the get-go mm -hmm. bright little souls and they've got so much to teach us Absolutely. so i mean i'm a great one i always talk about read the baby not the book i mean yeah. The poor baby hasn't read the book, so, you know, they're a little bit scuppered if you're telling them what to do and they haven't actually got that message. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I don't think I read any books. I think the only book I read was, um, because I'm half French, I read a, a really great book called Bringing Up Bibi, which is just French parenting style versus sort of Western, US versus British. And and she talked, there's a lady in there, that, that a very big figurehead in French parenting, who had a radio show for many years, who, and, and one of the things that she said is just basically treat the babies like you would treat an adult, just assume intelligence and assume they can understand and just speak to them in a normal voice like you would do to a normal person and just yeah. tell them what you're going to do just because they yeah. can't say words back doesn't mean they're not thinking or they're not trying to say it in baby language or, or whatever yeah. and and so that, and that that kind of like I was like oh I can buy into that yeah that makes sense and that's basically all I did I didn't read any parenting books and I just went from that premise and mm -hmm. and I think if you can just tune into your baby and mm -hmm. assume that they understand rather than assume that they're stupid yeah it can just make it so much easier and, and allow their consciousness to flourish rather than put a lid on it you know yes um, it also feeds the confidence of the mother yes and i think so many um so many times i i see mothers because i particularly work with mothers but but parents in general um floundering because where they are at and where their baby at is is disconnected and if if and, and as a doula, I am able to facilitate space for them to get to know each other, to, to get confident in what they're doing. And, and that's an incredible, I, I, what a privilege for me to, to be able to, to be there with these, with these families as they're on that journey. Um, but, but yes, to start to, to learn their baby. And, and they often say, oh, but I don't know, Sophie, what, what does that mean? And actually they are the expert in their baby, not me, absolutely not. You know, yes, a brand new one day old baby giving certain cries, it's quite easy in some ways to, to identify what they're saying, but, but their personalities emerge massively over the first few days. And who am I to say what their baby's telling them? I'm not spending 24 hours a day with their baby. They know far better. So it's for me to kind of empower them to go, oh, I think he's, I think he's cold, or I think he's hungry, or I think he just needs a cuddle. We're primates. We're designed to hold and be close to our babies, and so much of our modern um, technology is is 
is not such a good thing when it comes to babies. We, you know, put our babies in these things away from us and we use these apps rather than coming back to our sort of primal instinctive being. Mm -hmm. We, you know, life has, has developed so quickly and evolution isn't that fast. So we're still sort of meant to be in those lovely village communities, the cave women, the, you know, surrounded by our nurturing network, our support network. So all of these things that have been designed are supposed to make our lives easier, but sometimes I don't think they do. Mm. So just thinking about that, that new parenting bit and how women can maybe tune into that, that mother instinct, for want of a better word, without all that worry about, well, that book says this, that book says that, you know, just to really kind of, yeah, tune into her own intuition. You know, what, what if anything, do you think she can be doing during her pregnancy to start laying the foundation for that? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's very interesting. I've always had this, maintained this belief that in pregnancy, women, and I was the same, sort of psychologically get themselves to a point um, of the birth. It's like birth is this gate. Yeah, it's like D-Day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The gate's not going to open into the parenting world until you've gone through that. But actually, birth is just a day. You know, it's, it's, it's incredibly important to prepare for birth and and you know as a birth doula I do a huge amount of work with women to to prepare for birth to to consider what they need to take responsibility for their bodies for their babies um, and to make those decisions about where is going to be best for them with whom I'm absolutely passionate about birth physiology I bang on about hormones and oxytocin until people are bored rigid um except for their fact that they're not because you know oxytocin isn't talked about enough in in traditional antenatal classes why is that i mean you know the things that women all know about birth oh i'm going to have contractions i'm going to push a baby out that all happens because of hormones because of physiology so why don't we look at that bit of it and understand how those hormones work. That oxytocin is, as Michelle Odin says, it's shy. So we want to work with and understand oxytocin and make it as as beautiful as a, an environment for it to flourish. Because if it flourishes, endorphins, our natural pain relievers, will flourish, and both will go hand in hand. And you know, great, fantastic. But if I've deviated off a bit from that, actually oxytocin and endorphins have a very big part to play in the early parenting journey too. Oxytocin is one of the hormones associated with breastfeeding. So in terms of preparation for parenting, as a doula, I often talk to parents about what their expectations of the first few weeks with a new baby are going to be like. Because so many of us have never even held a newborn baby before when we're pregnant. Like, I don't know if you had, but I was the first of any of my friends to have a baby. I didn't really know that stuff. I mean, I was passionate about it, but I hadn't had that. I hadn't grown up with hundreds of babies around me. You know, and I was one of those people, exactly. if you handed me a baby, I'd hold them at arm's length and look at them like of some course. kind of specimen, you know. I was like, yeah, so yeah, totally. I totally get what you're saying. And when it comes to nappy changing, I mean, I watch some new parents take half an hour to change a newborn's nappy and I think, oh my goodness, you're going to get weed on at least once. Yeah. <laughs> and then some. I get something else on you as well. <laughs> um, so yes, I think it's so, so important to, to look at um, to look at those first few weeks, it fascinated me. There's um, there's an, an organisation near me that that offer parenting uh, courses, and they um, they did a poll of lots of their parents to say how many of you would have liked to have done a course during your pregnancy to discuss your relationship with each other, the parents. Because we know the statistics show that a lot of couples come unstuck in the first year mm. after the birth of their child. Um, and so many parents came back and said, 
oh my God, we would have loved that. It would have been brilliant. And so they put on this course, they launched this course saying, come you pregnant mothers and fathers and, you know, discuss, you know, what it's going to be like um, having a new baby and how you can support each other. And not one couple signed up, not one. And, um, and I think that's really interesting. It's, you know, the benefit of hindsight is a great thing, isn't it? We can all look at that first year after we've had our baby and go, oh my God, I wish someone had told <laughs> yeah. No, I know. It's that conversation. Yeah. But the couples need to look at this stuff because they're, they are going to be parenting, um, you know, with sleep deprivation. They're going to be moving into a different role in their lives. And so many of the women that I work with are career women. You know, the most women that I work with are certainly in their late 30s, if not in their early to mid 40s. They are uber successful, incredibly impressive career women. And having a baby can be a massive, massive turnaround, you know, huge impact on their lives. So how are they... You know, how are they going to be supported in those first few weeks, knowing that the likelihood is that the, the partner will have to go back to work within a week, within two weeks? Um, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to have, you know, much, much more shared parental care and for that to be recognized as a good thing in industry rather than a, what you're taking more time off to be home with your baby um, and to recognize that. You know, the partner's going off and is working a full day and is coming home knackered, probably. But also the mum's been working a full day and a full night because she's got a new baby. And I don't want to call having a baby a job, but it is the hardest work we will ever do. Parenting is often the hardest thing we will ever do in our entire lives. Yeah. And we're learning the whole time. We're complete amateurs when we come to start doing it. So... It, you know, if we can look at some of those things in advance, put that support network in place, get that community around you so that you know you're going to be able to get some extra sleep. You know that someone else is going to make a meal for you. I mean, how sad that in this country, motherhood is somehow regarded as a second class citizen thing. Mm -hmm. You know, in other communities, in other cultures, Mothers are raised up and are esteemed. They are goddesses. They've just done the most incredible thing in their life, bringing forth new life and feeding that new life. So, you know, the, the community fight over themselves to bring meals and clean the house and facilitate her having sleep and taking children to school and all of those lovely, lovely things. Here, the focus is on how quickly can we get back into our skinny jeans? Mm. You know, how quickly can we leave the baby and go back to work? Mm. That, to my mind, is is tragic. And I think the other thing is that today, you know, the, the, the idea of being able to put your support system in place, it sounds lovely to be able to plan like that, but a lot of people can't because that support system isn't actually there to put in place. You know, no. a lot of people move away from their families, yes. don't live in their hometown where they've got their aunts and their mums and their grannies and their whatevers. And they might have just, you know, they've gone to uni, they've stayed in the town where they're at uni, they've, some of their mates are uni mates or their workmates, and maybe they don't know them that well. And, and maybe they don't have that support network to actually put in place. And, and so, you know, it's thinking about what do you need to, what, how are you going to deal with this? You know? Yeah, which is where I think postnatal doulas are so valuable. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I know that because I'm, I'm certainly I found that very isolating that new mother period where I don't have the family that I can draw on. I don't have, and a lot of my friends ended up moving away, and I wasn't in, surrounded by friends that had babies because none of us had babies. I was one of the only ones, so there wasn't anybody, you know, that kind of understood what I was going through. And yeah. then we've had to sort of end up, yeah, paying for that childcare support because yeah. otherwise there's just no way that you can get through it. But then you know, got to think about the budgeting side of it and the financial aspect of it. I mean, it's expensive yeah. enough having kids anyway, and then you've got to sort yeah. of throw in the childcare piece uh, above and beyond, you. Know, you know nursery and, and, and all that good stuff so yeah. yeah it is a it is definitely something that I think to give some mental space to but I you know it's so and it's so obvious you know as, as, as somebody who's been pregnant and the birth is can take up so much headspace mm. and so much worry and fear because of maybe what we hear in the media that yeah they're like well I'll deal with that when I get to it I'll cross that yeah. bridge when I get to it and and actually you know there they maybe are things so just thinking about putting that support in place what about sort of working 
for me, it's like, you know, if you haven't got... The way I look at it is you can you can try and put all that external stuff in place, but you have very little control over that external stuff because right. people can let you down or they don't exist. Those people don't actually exist for you to draw on everything. But the one thing you can control is you and right. how you respond to things and how you will feel about things. That's something that you can work with. And that was definitely made. That was because I knew I didn't have those supports around me that I took that route of like, well, OK, I'm going to just build me up so that I feel strong to cope, that I feel able to do this. And right. And and that 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 worked for me, thankfully. Thank you know, goodness. And I, I know it's not going to work for everybody. I just wondered what your view was in terms of how women maybe can work with them, on themselves to maybe prepare themselves. How they can maybe adjust their mindset or prepare in emotionally or. I think one thing I think I want to pick up on is is the financial side of things. It's really interesting that a lot of couples are prepared to shell out hundreds of pounds for a buggy but I would rather see that money spent because actually how important is a buggy do you know what I mean yeah no I know I, I it drives me nuts the way that women well people families spend so much on a bunch of wheels and a just... Moses basket like why do babies need Moses baskets yeah. I, that to me like really what do babies what do newborn babies actually need something on their bottoms you know you need to be able to clean wipe their bottoms some clothing to keep them warm or actually you know let's keep the skin to skin going because research shows just how incredibly beneficial that is both for babies and for mums and I, I I mean I often find when I go and talk to to new mums that they they almost look a bit disappointed when I say have you considered putting your baby skin to skin as if I'm trying to fob them off with some kind of crap suggestion because I haven't got anything better to give them. And actually the research around skin to skin is mind blowing, not just for babies, but for mums too, because mm. we need to really consider maternal mental health. You know, if we go back to considering, you know, the community, the mums who have community in that culture where they're raised up and adored and supported, the incidences of postnatal depression, postnatal anxiety are so low compared to here where mm. you, you use the word isolated. Mm. So many mums are sitting behind a closed front door, mm. not seeing anybody all day. That's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. So, you know, how do we how do we get more sense of community going? Um, so I would love to see, obviously, I would love to see more people, you know, hiring doulas because I am one and I, but, you know, separate to that, the benefits of having somebody coming in and, and you know, raising you up mentally and emotionally and physically and practically and answering all those questions that you have. I mean, you know, I love I love going and sitting with mums of newborns and they bring out these lists of questions, many of which are about baby's poo. I love it. I love it. Because how amazing to go through to her to her list and for her to say at the end, well oh, I think that's it. Oh, I feel so good now. This is great. Let's go for a walk. Let's go in the sunshine. Let's go and get a cup of tea. Um, or would you mind, you know, going and running an errand for me whilst I get some sleep or whatever. So that for me, I think is really important. Let's take the emphasis off what we need to buy materialistically to have a baby. Let's think a lot more about what we need to invest in for our mental, emotional well-being. Mm. Um, in terms of a good headspace, preparing for your birth, I think, has a big, big impact because we know that how your birth goes has a big, uh, it tells, you know, it, it informs your postnatal period in a big way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I was a case in point in that, you know, I was that person who felt like, you know, I felt like my body had let me down. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel marvelous in the postnatal period I was recovering from a, a cesarean, which is, you know, it's major abdominal surgery. I couldn't walk properly. Um, I was very uncomfortable. And I was getting to grips with this brand new baby at the same time. And that's so hard. I mean, I am all in favor. If, if someone feels like 
the cesarean is a is the right option, the positive option for her. I will wholeheartedly support her in, in achieving that, in having a positive cesarean experience. But I am never going to say to someone that that's the easy option because it's not. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it may feel easy at the time, but you've got six weeks of recovery, mm-hmm. you know, in a postnatal period where you've got a newborn baby to deal with mm-hmm. as well. So, yeah, I think... Mm-hmm. Um, that preparing for your birth is really important. I think preparing for feeding is really important. What I what I'm aware of is that the vast majority of women um, want to and plan to breastfeed their babies, but that we in this country have a huge drop off in terms of statistics of those who initiate and those who are still feeding at six weeks. That to me is tragic, mm. because if someone wants to breastfeed but isn't supported well or educated well to do that, then often we hear that she feels less than, that she feels, again, maternal mental health uh, is is not great. Um, There's there's a lot of sort of postnatal depression and uh, anxiety and things associated with with struggling with breastfeeding. So I talk a lot about preparing for feeding with those parents who would like to initiate breastfeeding. And again, I'm not there banging a drum going, you've got to breastfeed because it's amazing. I do think it's amazing. But I recognize that that's me and other people have different viewpoints. Um, And if they choose to not pursue breastfeeding for whatever reason, again, I'm going to support them to formula feed their baby in the best and safest way they can. Mm. But for those who want to breastfeed, I, I actually do a lot of preparation work with them antenatally um, about feeding mm. and that makes a huge difference too mm. so that, I mean that, that doesn't always form part of a lot of antenatal courses or does it that feeding element no, no. so what no. kind of prepare what kind of prep work are you talking about are you talking about sort of understanding breastfeeding positions or um, how long it I don't know what kind of stuff might you cover in those sessions with them I think so much of it, so much of the work that I do comes down to dispelling myths. Yeah. Like, you know, people have all of these misconceptions. Um, I worked with a, I met a lovely, lovely young couple in um, in hospital recently when I was volunteering. And, um, and she was formula feeding her one day old. And I just went to chat to them as a, as a volunteer to say, hi, how are you doing? And she said, oh, but I'm, I'm formula feeding. And I said, yeah, no, I know, that's, that's fine, just finding out how you are, how do you feel, how do your breasts feel? Because even though you're formula feeding, you know, your body is going through changes. And she said, oh, uh, yeah, uh, but I can't breastfeed. And I said, oh, okay, why is, why is that then? And she said, well, I don't know if I can say this. And I said, oh, okay, fine. You know, uh, and she said, well, because I've been told that when you breastfeed, you have an orgasm. Oh, my word. Yeah. And and I said, oh, OK, well, you know, I've been supporting breastfeeding mothers for a very, very long time. And I've never heard anyone say that to me before. And I, but what I have heard many times, and I go back to my favorite oxytocin topic is that you know you release uh, the, the lovely feel good uh, love hormone oxytocin when you're breastfeeding, so you can feel very very in love with your baby, and you know you can have these lovely warm fuzzy feelings, but not not an orgasm as far as I know. And she went, oh right, okay. And then she said, but I can't breastfeed because I'm a smoker. And I said, okay, well actually we can take a look at that, and 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 you can breastfeed if you're a smoker we need there are other things that we need to consider around smoking and safety with babies but breastfeeding is something that you know you can do if you're a smoker and then she said oh but I eat a rubbish diet I eat junk food and I drink fizzy pop and I said well again you know you might not feel great if you're eating that and breastfeeding but your baby will get everything your baby needs from you she went, oh, right, okay. And then and then she said, oh, but you've got to do one or the other. You've got to either breastfeed or formula feed. And I said, again, <laughs> you can do whatever works for you if you want to combination feed. And bless his darling heart, her partner turned around to her and went, 
you should do it. <laughs> oh, brilliant. You should do it. You should give it a go. And she looked at me and she said, I want to. I want to give it a go. I'm going to try. And I said, well, that's amazing. That's fantastic. And so the, the, the sort of the end of the story was that at the, ne- the next time her baby just had this massive formula feed, so of course it was passed out like a python, um, <laughs> at the next time that the baby asked to feed, she was supported to put the baby to the breast and the baby went to the breast. And when they followed up a week later, she was exclusively breastfeeding. Okay. And for me, the, the kind of I, I get goosebumpy when I think about that because I think about her going back to her community, to her friends, and and being able to dispel the myths with them because she heard it from them or you know whoever. But for her to go back and to be breastfeeding her baby and to go, well, no, I can. I know I'm a smoker and I know I eat crap food and I know I, you know, this, that and the other. But no, actually, I can do this. And that that makes me goosebumpy. I, I just love that. So, you know, I suppose that that example is just that there is so much misinformation out there about breastfeeding. There are so many people telling a whole load of rubbish and if we go back to my lovely mum she was told age 20 you know 23 um well you put your baby to the breast every four hours 10 minutes on each side and you do not give that baby anything else now you know that's not how breastfeeding works so if we've got a whole generation of women and probably the generation before them were told other you know, absolute rubbish too. If we've got those generations of women behind us who had difficult breastfeeding journeys because they were told absolute cat like that, then what does that do for our generation of women who are having their babies now, who are filled with this idea that breastfeeding is difficult or that they won't have enough milk or all of those kind of things. So mm. Dispelling those breastfeeding myths antenatally, I think, is really, really beneficial. Mm. Talking about how to facilitate the the best possible start if they want to feed, and that goes back to my favorite skin to skin again. You know, let's get those babies skin to skin, undisturbed with mum for the first, you know, hour or two or many after birth so Mm. that those babies, as you said, are so conscious, they're so bright, they have powerful instincts to mm. feed to find the breast to crawl up and you know locate a nipple and and do it all on their own as my daughter did you know I kind of looked down and went oh my god you know she's found it on her own and she's latched on and she's feeding yeah if we facilitate that amazing that's brilliant mm. Mm. we keep mums and babies together as much as possible brilliant mm, if we mm. give them support when they're having the first inkling of a of a problem then we can look at position and attachment and, and make sure that they are are more comfortable and then that any potential issues don't escalate because so many women get to a point where they go i just can't do this anymore my nipples hanging off it's just I, I, i'm never putting the baby anywhere near me ever again like that took time for that to happen. Why was she not given the support earlier on? Why were things not identified and put mm. right? Why didn't people just go and sit with her for as long as she needed to make that happen? Mm. And, you know, sadly, our midwives are so, so, so stretched. They are brilliant. I love midwives, but they are so stretched. We are so understaffed that they don't have the time to just go and be with women for as long as that woman needs, which could be two hours, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so fortunate that I, I have that time in the work that I do to do that. Mm. Well, Sophie, I, I, we could talk all day, couldn't we? I've just We could, this. we really could. <laughs> <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating. I loved hearing your story and I loved, yeah, and all that stuff that women parents can do before the birth arrives to prepare is I think is invaluable. And, and I hope that people listen to this and thinking, you know what, I'm going to take this a little bit more seriously and they're going to seek out some information. So thank you for maybe hopefully waking up a few people into the the value of doing that kind of work before the little one arrives. Now, if anybody wants to find out more about you, where can they find about, find you online? 
Oh, um, well, I run Nurturing Birth alongside my brilliant, brilliant doula colleague, Florence Etienne Jackson. Um, so nurturingbirth.co.uk is where you can find out all about our doula courses and our doula mentoring. Um, we also run the Nurturing Birth directory, which is where pregnant women, families can find all different support and services they need um, during pregnancy, birth, the postnatal period, infant feeding. So that's nurturingbirthdirectory.com. Is that a global uh, network or is that it's a global, UK yeah. global? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We are, you know, we it's incredibly affordable to come and list yourself on there. But we've got we've got people in Portugal, we've got people in Dubai oh, list cool. on there. So we want to make it as easy for women and families to find the kind of support that they need mm. uh, so yes nurturingbirthdirectory.com useful resource uh, there thank you <laughs> and I'm, um, I'm on sophiebriggs.com which frankly I haven't looked at or updated for a while so I probably need to go, go and have a look at that um, but we're on social media um, our what is it our handle is at nurturing underscore birth to Twitter and Instagram. And we've got a Facebook page, Nurturing Birth Doulas, where we post stuff every single day for parents, for doulas, for people who are interested in, in birth and pregnancy and feeding. You know, we're there and we, we love talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and having a chat. And yeah, my second doula of the year that I've spoken to. So thank you once again, Sophie, for coming on the podcast. An absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hello, you've just been listening to me, Alexia Leachman on the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. Now, this is just a wee reminder that if you're looking for more help, support and guidance on your fear free journey to motherhood, then visit fearfreechildbirth.com where you can find fear clearance meditations, online birth prep courses, training for birth professionals, a membership community and programs for overcoming tocophobia. Until next time, bye for now.